Good morning, Chapel Creek. Let's get on our feet and worship. Sing, I raise. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a I'm gonna say I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm Sing, I raise, I raise the hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise the hallelujah, and I will watch the darkness flee. I raise.
such a fragile being in this crazy large universe and somebody who I thought was like larger than life somebody who was just a great human being somebody who loved God and was being Jesus to people going out you know visiting the sick stopping for people who had car accidents and just really making a difference somebody like that to be taken from the world seemed like impossible but it was a, it's a clear reminder that we live in a world that is not our home something that I feel like really puts things into perspective but for me I, I think it gives me more hope than anything because at least we know that we're gonna be able to see him again and so through the midst of of these crazy times the midst of these turmoil and trials we can raise a hallelujah to God because we know that at the end of the day he already won the victory amen so let's raise a hallelujah this morning. Let's lift up his name for he is worthy and we are going to see him one day very soon in all his glory. Let's sing. Here we go. Let's sing that again. I don't want to. I don't want. 
stand. So here I stand, high in surrender. I need you now. Oh, my heart, now and forever, my soul cries out. Once I was broken, but you love my church, you know, let's sing it out. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by jealous.
Good morning, Chapel Creek Fellowship. Hey, God is good all the time. Uh, it's really great to be back. Uh, we had a great time skiing, and I want to say just what a blessing it is to have someone like uh, Brother Hollis step in. Dusty came in and preached last week and talked about uh, just uh, our influence, and I want to just say thank you to him, and I heard that he did a great job. Amen. Would you just let Dusty know? I don't know if he's, he's probably working with the kids today, but yeah, he did a great job, and what a blessing it is to be able to go, and then just know that someone's going to be able to step into the pulpit and bring God's word, so uh, that's awesome, but it's great to be back. Uh, we had a great time in Colorado, and uh, we uh, haven't been in four years. We went, uh, normally do an annual ski trip with the church, and uh, the last time we went, uh, Debbie broke her femur, <laughs> so we hadn't been back in a while, and we uh, went back this year. It was the first time in a while, and I just realized uh, what a difference uh, four years makes when you're old. So, <laughs> so we took it pretty easy, but we had a great time. It was a lot of fun and uh, just a great break, and thank you for just allowing us to be gone like that, but it's good to be back, and we're starting a brand new series. It's uh, February, and we all know that in February, at least if you're in a relationship, you know that February is what? What's in the middle of February? Valentine's Day, right? It's the one day. It's the day. It better be more than one day. But uh, anyway, we're starting a series on relationships, and we're calling it The Fight. And I, and, and I thought it was kind of funny that we called it The Fight because, you know, when you think about great relationships, you don't, the word fight doesn't really enter into the thinking there when you're having a relationship. But but what the premise is for the series is that there are some things that are worth fighting for. As a matter of fact, the best things in life, the things that matter the most, are the things that we're willing to fight for. And we live in a time, uh, really, in our culture, whenever um, relationships, godly relationships, relationships that are, bring honor to the kingdom are something that we have to fight for. Uh, it doesn't happen automatically, and it's not easy and, uh, and the world actually, the world actually gives us a, the wrong idea about what it takes to have a great relationship. And we have to, as God's people, we have to not go by the standard of the world, but we need to go by the word of God to determine what it takes to have a great relationship. Because the world, the world gets it wrong. The world... Uh, gives us bad advice. As a matter of fact, if you're, if you're looking at the advice that the world would give, did you know that uh, over 90% of sexual relationships on television, let's talk, talk about movies, but 90% of sexual relationships portrayed on television are between an unmarried couple. And that's what, that's what the world is selling us. That's what the world wants us to think. That's what we grow up being exposed to but the Bible has something different for us, and the Bible says that there's a better way and a different way. The world's way says, find the right person, fall in love, fix all your hopes and dreams on them, and if failure happened, repeat steps one, two, and three. And that's the way the world looks at it, and that's really bad advice for people that are wanting to have a great marriage. Great marriages... Great relationships are, sad to say, an exception to the rule. Great relationships uh, don't always happen because we usually go by the advice that the world gives us. But the Bible says that there is a different way. In the Bible in Romans 12, 2, it says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So the Bible is telling us right here, the world has a way, a pattern for relationships and for decisions that you make, but the Bible says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and to prove what, is God, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's Romans 12 too. The New Living Translation says it like this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. By changing the way that you think. Then you will know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And so we have the world is telling us this is the way that you live. This is what makes a good relationship. This is how you, uh, this is how you respond to your spouse. This is, what is, this is how you do it. 
You find the right person, you fall in love. Man, it's like you fall, like falling off a cliff, right? It's, you you got to be sure that you find the right one. And then, and then you just fall, fall in love, right? And, and then you put all of your hopes and your dreams on that part. That's what the world says to do. But here's what happens when you do that. You set them up for failure because that person that you've put your affection on, that person that you've chosen, that person that you're hanging all of your dreams on, that person that you're praying will meet all of your needs was never wired, never designed, never able to complete that, to to fulfill those needs. The only person that is ever able to do that is God because we're broken people. And when we expect that from someone else, we're setting them up for failure. And so uh, we're going to have to learn how to fight and fight the right way and for the right things to have a great marriage. Great marriages are an exception. They're not the rule. Uh, But you can, but you can have a great marriage. You can have a fantastic marriage. Having a fantastic marriage doesn't mean that you're always going to agree on every point. Amen, Deb? You can have a great marriage and you can be polar opposites. Did you know that? Deb and I are, we're opposite. We're different in almost every regard. Almost. I'm a great driver. We drove to Colorado, amen? Yeah, I'm not a great driver. Anyway, but, <laughs> but we're different on so many things. But our marriage is it's awesome. We love each other. And it's not a thing that we fell into, you know? As a matter of fact, whenever Debbie and I met, we were 16 years old. I'm telling you, you're, you're too young and stupid to even know what love is about at 16. By the grace of God, we accepted Jesus when we were 18, after we got married. Oh, uh, maybe 19, 18, 19, somewhere around in there. Anyway, and God taught us that being a great spouse doesn't mean you find the right person. Because I just say there's not a right person. I mean, everybody that you think are so awesome They all have flaws. No one is perfect. We all have baggage. Your baggage is different than my baggage, but we all have it. We all have issues. And in your marriage, in your marriage, you're going to discover that that person that you hung all those hopes and dreams and all those things on, that they're flawed people, that they're not perfect. But the Bible says that the way that we have great marriages that last and bring honor to the kingdom is that we come to this place where we realize that we don't conform to the pattern of this world or to the thinking of this world, and that we're, our minds and our thinking needs to be transformed by the Word of God. And so when the world says that we should do something a certain way or that success is this or that a great marriage looks like this, I would say you should probably hold that up to the Scripture and see what the Bible says about that. In every place that it doesn't align with Scripture, let's change that Because Scripture is the one thing that we have that's a constant, that doesn't change. It is truth. It is the truth. God's plan for relationship is different than the world's plan. God's plan says, not find the right person, but become the right person. Don't find the right person, become the right person. Because the person that you find is flawed and you're flawed, but the Bible says that we can become the right person in Jesus Christ. That whenever we meet Jesus Christ and he moves into our life and he changes our heart, that he changes everything. It's not that God gives you the ability and the skill to have a great marriage. God transforms us. He changes us. And whenever we yield ourselves, whenever we give ourselves to the transforming love of Christ and the word of God and we apply those to our life, we start to become the right person, and we can have a marriage that can withstand any storm, that that can get through anything, that can have disagreements and decide that we're not going to bail. We can love each other through anything, and God can fix anything. And you say, well, no, you don't. Already, I mean, I feel a little like, okay, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know what I've been through. You're right. I don't know what you've been through, but I do know what the Bible promises, I do know what the scripture says. And the Bible says that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so it's not about finding the right person. It's about becoming the right person. 
if we in our relationships will decide that I'm not going to fix them. Can you, can you go into your marriage and say, can you go into your relationship with your spouse and say, my job is not to fix them. That's not my job. I'm not going to fix them. Have you ever tried to straighten out your spouse, anyone? Don't raise your hand. Get one of these. But we have, right? I mean, you've, we assume that they don't get it right, and so instead of praying for them, we pray about them. And we want God to fix them. And I, I just say to you as your pastor, look, you need to pray about God fixing you. You need to pray about God doing a work in your heart because God will, and it's about becoming the right person. And then it's about walking in love. It's not about falling in love. It's about walking in love. It's about learning. Remember, God wants to transform your mind, the renewing of your mind. And whenever we understand what God did for us and how he changed us, we can begin not to fall in love but to walk in love. And there's a whole, that's a whole different thing. Because it seems like to me, whenever we fall in love, it's about emotion and about feeling. And I've got hearts popping over my head and syrup is running out of my ears. And everything that they do is beautiful and perfect. What a lie. What a lie. Whenever we become the right person and we receive the love of Christ and we accept that and we understand what it took to have that kind of love for us and we start walking in that love, it will change the way that we react to our spouse in every circumstance. Because the world says, do it for you. Live for you. Have a relationship that fulfills your needs. Have a relationship that makes you feel better. And when it stops working that way, when you stop feeling better, whenever they stop delivering, then you have an opportunity to get out. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that if we'll receive Christ and his love and we start walking in that love, it's the opposite of what we get out of it. It's what we can put into it. How can I love my spouse? How can I demonstrate that love to them? How can I show them this selfless, unconditional love? What can I do to show that to them? And to deliver that and walk in that. And it's not easy, it's not easy, not easy, not easy at all. I promise it's not easy. If you've been married more than a couple of weeks, you know that's not easy, amen? It's not, but it's possible. It's not, it's not probable, but it's possible. And how is it possible? It's possible when we experience the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It's possible when we start to emulate him. It's possible whenever we allow our minds to be transformed by the truth and we start walking in that love. And when you start to demonstrate the love that has been de demonstrated to you, your relationship will begin to transform. And there's nothing, there's nothing that you can't get through. And I know that that sounds tough, but it is it is possible when we walk in love. And then fix all of your hopes and dreams, not on each other, but on God. Fix all of your hopes and dreams on God instead of each other. And then if there is failure, if there are problems, repeat steps one, two, and three. Amen? Because there will be. Debbie and I have been married for four. 40 years and a half. 40 years and a half. And uh, there's times where I, where I have absolutely disappointed her. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are times whenever I have not been focused on, on our relationship but on, on other things and haven't pursued her and given her the attention that she needs and disappointed. But she didn't leave. She didn't walk out because she walked in love, walking in love. And that's what we do. Whenever we learn as couples to put all of our hopes and dreams on God, then our marriages will be transformed. And see, I think that's the kind of commitment that's worth fighting for. And that's what it takes is commitment. If you're going to have a marriage that succeeds, it takes commitment. And I'm Commitment is a thing that we don't like to talk about. And probably in the series, this is going to be the toughest message out of the whole series. Because commitment is that thing that says, after the feeling leaves, where I've made the initial agreement and I've made the decision, after that feeling leaves, I'm still willing to carry on. 
There's a guy in our church that you may not know him. If you're new here, you don't know him. His name's Gene Hatcher, and he's a, he's a world champion boxer, and he's got a couple of belts, a couple of big old belts that he won back in the 80s, boxing. Two, two belts, two different titles. And uh, it's amazing to me when you talk to Gene about the commitment that it took to get those, to win those belts. Like, it wasn't something that he just woke up one day and said, you know what, I think I'll be a boxer, and I think I'll just go out and, I mean, talent will get you so far. But every day, I mean, every day, Gene was at it, training, training, training every day, running every day, like miles and miles and miles every day. I would start out with him maybe about 50 yards, and I'd tell him, uh, you go on and be the world champion boxer, I'll stay back and preach, amen? Because I couldn't do it. I wouldn't be willing to make that kind of a commitment. But if we're going to do anything and have success in anything in our life, it takes this thing called commitment. It's a commitment that is worth fighting for. Your marriage, your marriage outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important relationship that you will ever have. But boy, I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but let me do, I'm going to do it anyway. Because sometimes we confuse, if you've got children, if you're married and you've got children, sometimes we have the misconception that our kids are the most important commitment that we have. That is not true. That God never designed the family that way. God is a God of order, and God brought Adam and Eve together, and he said to Adam, this is your priority. He said to Eve, this is your priority. And the kids, the kids, mom and dad, come somewhere under that. I, I'm just, okay, I'm just going to get this off my chest. I've talked to parents before that have said, we really like going to this certain church, but our kids are not happy, so we're going to go somewhere else. Man, are you kidding me? Don't let the inmates run the asylum, amen? The biggest priority you have outside of Jesus Christ is your spouse. The biggest priority that you have, the biggest commitment that you have is to your spouse. If you want your kids to have a chance, then demonstrate what a godly relationship looks like to them and don't let them think that they run the show. Don't ever let your children pit you against one another because your children are smarter than you. They know how it works. But mom said, don't let them do that. Anyway, that's a parenting sermon, not a marriage sermon. We'll get back to it later. So we need to have commitment. We need to have commitment. If we're going to have a godly marriage, if we're going to have a marriage that will last, if we're going to have a marriage that's an exception to the rule, we've got to make a commitment to one another. We've got to be willing to put in the work. We've got to be willing to put in the time. We've got to put in the hours. We've got to get on the road and start running. We've got to do the hard thing to make it work because marriages are work. Good marriages are hard work. And if you want a great marriage, then you make these commitments, and I think that you'll find out that you can have success. The Bible says this in Malachi. This is a tough read, but I want you to listen to it. The Bible says another thing that you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. Oh, you're crying all the time. You want God's help. You need him to get involved in your life. He says you weep and you wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why, and it's because the Lord is the witness between you and your wife, the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant, has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. And the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one that he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and don't be unfaithful. And the Bible saying right there, look, you've got to be faithful to each other. It It matters. This relationship matters. It's a covenant relationship. It's not a contract. It's not something that the world put together, but it's a covenant between a man and a woman saying that I will forever. I will forever. I will not quit. I say it in every, it's part of every marriage vow, better or worse, better or worse, till death do us part. And I think sometimes maybe we should put a little addendum in there, right? A little asterisk, death or this or that or that or that. But that's not what the Bible says. Till death do us part. And we need, to be, we need to be serious about that covenant relationship that we have. So let me tell you how to fight. Maybe you don't know how to do it. 
Maybe you don't know how to fight for your relationship. Maybe you're not sure about the commitment that you make. Let me give you four commitments that every good marriage is going to have to have to succeed. Succeed, not just get by. Succeed. We need to make these commitments. Number one, and I think that we see these from the word of God, and I think that we see these from God's love for us. These are commitments that God made to us, and we can follow his example. Number one, I will fight to put you first. I will fight to put you first. I'm going to commit to making you the most important. You are my priority. And, and where do we get that? We get it from, from the Bible. And John 3.16 says, this is, how, uh, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. We ought to put each other first. A commitment to put someone else first. It's unselfish. It fights against the advice of the world. It goes against the grain of the world. This is what it takes to have a successful marriage. To say to your spouse, you know what? You're first. Whatever we're going through, you're first. I'm going to think about you first. I'm going to put you before me. It it answers all kinds of questions and it solves all kinds of problems whenever we look at our spouse and say, you know what? Your needs matter more than my needs. It changes a selfish part of our life whenever we will let go and release and say to each other, you matter more than me. Your needs are greater than my needs, and I'm going to give myself up for you. And you say, well, that doesn't feel good. That doesn't, that's not what I want. I want it to be about me. What about me? Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, this is how the world will know that I love you. They'll know, you'll, you'll know what love is. It's the way that you love each other. And Jesus laid down his life for us. We had nothing to offer. And he said, I'm giving myself away. I'm giving myself to you. And I would say, if you want your marriage to be transformed, if you want your relationships to last, if you want your relationships to be successful, then just start saying it's not about me. I'm going to give myself up for you. I'm going to give myself up for you. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do because self fights against that. Self wants to have its way. Self wants to be taken care of. But if you have two people in a relationship that are saying, I surrender my rights and desires and needs, and I put yours before mine, your marriage will be transformed. That's the example that Jesus Christ gave us. He said, you matter more. I'm going to the cross for you. I make a commitment. I'm going to make a commitment to make you my priority, Debbie Day. You're my priority. You're first. And I want to live my life making you first. But it also helps when you make chicken fried steak. Just saying. (laughs) I'm putting you first, baby. Second commitment. Not only do we commit to priority, you're my priority. Priority above my children, priority above my grandkids, you're my priority. But then I'm going to fight for your heart. I'm going to fight for your heart. The Bible says that God fought for us. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock, he said. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they will be with me. And so here is God, and the picture is God is knocking at our heart's door. And he says, if you'll just open the door, I'll come in. He doesn't stop. He doesn't quit knocking. He doesn't give up and walk away. He says, I'm knocking. I'm knocking. What a great picture of, uh, for us about what real love does, because real love doesn't quit. Real love says, you're my priority. Real love fights for the heart of those people that we care about. Real love says, I'm knocking at the door. I'm knocking at the door. I'm knocking at the door. If you'll open the door, we can talk about this. We can get this done. We can be better than we were. We can forgive one another. I'm knocking at the door. I'm knocking at the door. You don't open the door, what do you do? You just keep knocking at the door. The Bible says that that's the way that we love each other. I'm going to fight for your heart. 
I'm going to make that my deal. I'm going to make that my priority. I'm going to find out what your love language is, and I'm just going to keep knocking at your heart. I'm going to win your heart. I'm going to keep going until you open up and let me come in. Look, husbands and wives, there are times in our relationships when we have these closed, hard hearts, and nobody wants to give. Nobody wants to surrender. Nobody wants to open up. And I'm just saying to you, if you start loving each other and living for each other, and you start saying that I'm just going to pursue your heart, I'm going to chase your heart down, that that is a priority priority to me, and I'm not giving up. I'm going to just keep knocking. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. Eventually, that hard heart will open up. If we're going to have successful marriages, if we're going to have marriages that will withstand, we have to fight for each other's heart. Do you know what it takes to capture your spouse's heart? Do you know what it means to pursue them? I think you did, or you probably wouldn't be married. There's probably a time in your relationship whenever you spend a lot of energy and thought about how to chase that heart down. Right, guys? And you, you, went, you went to a lot of trouble to make sure that you caught their heart and their attention. Whenever Debbie and I first started dating, I did whatever I had to do to get her to go on a date with me. Whatever it took, because I wanted, I was pursuing her, and she was the prize, and that's what I wanted. I, that's what I wanted more than anything. I mean, I wanted to go out with Debbie Graves, Debbie Graves. I told my friends, that oh, Debbie Graves, she's something else, huh? I sure would like to go out on a date with old Debbie Graves. Whatever it took, I was willing to do. Got a new car, I thought, boy, that'll get her. I drove over to the Goat Roper parking lot. Y'all don't know about the Goat Roper parking lot. At my school, we had a hippie parking lot. And we had a Goat Roper parking lot. Goat Roper parking lot was all the people, all the kids that went to the rodeo and wore cowboy boots. And she was going with a fella that was a Goat Roper. Didn't matter to me because I wanted to go out of Debbie Graves. So I got in my 69 Chevelle and drove over to the Goat Roper parking lot. She was so impressed. No, I don't think she was impressed at all. I think she was laughing under her breath. I think it was a sympathy yes. But man, I was in pursuit. I wasn't going to stop. You ever see that cartoon with Pepe Le Pew, the little skunk? Huh? That's me. That's your pastor. Like I was just boom, boom, chasing her everywhere. Finally, I just wore her down. I think she just finally said, okay. And you, but you have, to, you have to continue. You have to continue to pursue their heart, to put in the energy, to understand what it takes to speak their love language. We've been married a long time, and I don't have a 69 Chevelle anymore, or long hair, or bell bottom pants. But I have her heart. That's what I wanted. And she has my heart. All of it. God has blessed us and allowed us to build a beautiful family. So grateful. So grateful. I'll fight for your heart. I'm going to fight for your identity. The Bible says that God fought for ours and he called us a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God says, I named you. I chose you. You are mine. And if I could say something to you married folks or people that want a relationship, that person that you chose, that person that you said I do to, that person that you're in covenant relationship with is yours. Is yours. One of the things that helps us get through stuff is that we came to this point where we realized that we belong to each other. We're not our own. We chose each other. Goods and bads, flaws and good stuff. We chose and we choose to love. Our identity is that. 
is that we chose. We picked. We chose you. I chose you. I pursued you. And in your marriage, understand that you belong to each other, that you're each other's possession. Well, that sounds weird, right? But you do. You belong to one another. Adam and Eve were created in the garden. The Bible says that God took a rib out of Adam and he made Eve and he brought Eve to Adam. And the Bible says that they became one flesh. Whenever you come into holy relationship through Jesus Christ and you start walking in love, you start to understand what it means to be one flesh. You belong to each other. You can't be separated. It's like trying to pull things apart. <laughs> I was trying to think of a really clever illustration there, but it just didn't happen. But uh, like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, after you make it, you can't take it apart. Got a little bit of peanut butter in one place and jelly in one place, it just doesn't happen. The Bible says that you belong to each other, and, and, and we need to understand that and, 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 and embrace that and start to live that way. Commit to your spouse's identity. And I will commit to fight to protect you. The Bible says that God said about us that the Lord will keep you from all harm and he will watch over your life. The Bible will keep you from all harm and he'll watch over your life. Look, husbands and wives, understand this. If you want a successful marriage, then you've got to fight to protect each other. Now, listen, I'm going to get right in your business for just a minute. Oh, I am. You belong to each other. You belong to each other. Just like we belong to Jesus. You make a covenant relationship with your spouse, you belong to each other. And that gives your spouse the right to get in your business. That gives them the right to have the code to your phone. That gives them the right for the password to your email. It's not yours and mine. It's us. It's we. And if you want success, then you have to allow your spouse and give them permission to protect you. And we ought to make it our business to fight, make a commitment to protect one another, that we would have a close enough intimate relationship that we can say to each other, listen, I can see where this is headed. I, I, I can see where this is, could be a problem, and I just want you to know that I love you enough, that I love our relationship enough, I love our marriage enough, that I'm not going to let go, and I'm not going to quit, and I won't shut up. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I love you, and I'm protecting you. God loved us enough to protect us. God loved us enough to give us the Holy Spirit to live in us, to keep us from things that we shouldn't be doing. And the Bible says that God is watching over us and keeping watch over us. And it's not about being nosy. It's not about being in your business. It's about taking care of one another, loving each other enough to put up some boundaries to keep us out of trouble, loving each other enough to set some guardrails so that we won't end up in the ditch, loving each other enough that we will sacrifice our time, that we'll sacrifice our energy, that we'll do whatever it takes to protect them because they're mine you belong to me and I'm going to take care of you I'm going to protect you from the attacks that the world will bring I'm going to protect you from the temptations that you may face you're my business you're my business then the last thing that I would say is this not in your notes it's not in your notes but I will fight for grace I'll fight for grace I'll fight for grace. Because there will be times, there will be times that your spouse is not going to get it right. There's going to be times when you won't get it right. But if we're walking in love, if we're walking in love, and we're saying to the Father, I'm going to give myself away for my spouse. I'm going to be in covenant relationship. There's going to be times when there has to be grace. There will be times whenever you're going to say, man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. There will be times whenever you'll think, this is bigger than I can forgive. This is bigger than I can get past. This is more than I can deal with. It takes the grace of God. That's what it takes. And you you may be saying, well, you don't understand what I've been through, what I'm going through. I don't. You are right. You're right. But I know the example that God gave us. Even when Jesus was on the cross, dying on the cross, his blood spilling for my sin, he looked at the people around him and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But you say, but I'm not Jesus. I can't do what Jesus did. See, that's not true. 
That's a lie that the enemy would want you to believe. But the Bible says that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we can do things in and through the blood of Jesus Christ that we could not do in and through ourselves. We don't have the power to do that, the strength to do that. But that's the thing I love about the gospel. That the gospel is not about helping you have strength. The gospel is about making you brand new and giving you strength to do things that you didn't think that you could do. Supernatural things. Forgiving people of things that you didn't think that you could forgive. Getting through hurts that you didn't think that you could get through. God can help you with that because he can change you. He can change you. And so I just want to say to you, husbands and wives, look, it takes an uncommon commitment to have a successful marriage. It takes an uncommon commitment. It takes something different than what the world says you need to do. It takes the Spirit of God in you to have a successful marriage. And it takes prayer and selflessness and commitment. But if you do that, if you fight the fight, you can have a marriage that will win. If you'll make the commitment and put in the time, you can have a marriage that's success. I would say that it starts on your knees. It starts by saying to each other, I commit to you, baby. I love you. You're mine. I'm going to do what it takes to protect you. And I'm going to offer grace when it needs to be offered. And I'm going to love you like Jesus loved me. We're going to learn to walk in love together. We're going to learn what a a holy marriage is all about. We're going to learn what covenant is. We're going to give to each other selflessly. And if you do that, you'll have a marriage that will be a success. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. No one looking around for just a minute. Just a minute. I know that everybody in here is not married. I know that. I understand that. But maybe you're going to be one day. And I'm praying that you write these notes down and that you remember these principles. And they'll help you. But if you're married this morning, if you're married this morning and and you just need to make a new commitment to each other a commitment to fight for your relationship maybe you could just grab your spouse's hand right now nobody looking around maybe just reach over there and grab their hand and maybe with your other hand you could just slip that up and say hey Pastor Keith let's pray together about this because I want to make a commitment I want to make a commitment to fight for my, my marriage I'm going to do the things that I need to do would you just slip your hands up together spouses husbands, wives can we do this just before the Lord let's just say this is what I want to do okay We're going to pray. If God's speaking to you this morning, and if there's things in your marriage that you need God to heal, things in your heart that you need to change, well, I would love to see you just bring each other down to this altar. Just Let's just pray right now over your marriages. Can we do that? I'm going to pray right now. If God's speaking to you, you come, would you? Thank you, Father. Thank you, God, for the gift of relationships. Thank you, God, for the gift of marriage. God, I pray for all of our church family this morning. God, I just pray that you'd be with them. God, I pray that you would help them. God, I pray that you would show them what you can do in and through us and how that you can change hearts and minds and lives. God, I pray that we would start to live for each other, that we would make real commitments to fight for our marriage in every area. God, that we would pursue each other's heart. God, that we would... That we would fight for our identity with each other. God, that we would just learn what it means to forgive and to love. God, I pray that you would help us have the strength to fight when we feel like giving up, to make a commitment, God, when we feel like that we have gone farther than we can go, that we would trust you and lean into you and and, and go forward with your help, God. We need you. We need you involved in our lives and in our marriages. And so I pray over all of the families here this morning that are represented everyone that raised their hand God help them today help them today God to fight 
Help them to fight for each other. Oh, God, I pray that we would commit to having great marriages and doing what it takes to have marriages that would please you. And I thank you for the families that are here, and I pray your blessing on this time together. God, use it. Holy Spirit, work in our lives and our hearts. Change us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But God speaking to you this morning, husbands and wives, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, just as a show of commitment to one another, why don't you just take your hand and come down to this altar and just, just kneel before God and ask God to bless your marriage and to help your marriage and to change your marriage and to change you. That's where it starts. Would you come? This time is for you. Be, be. He is jealous.